Hello, everybody. It's Mrs. Pound, and we are going to start Chapter 1, The Science of Life and the God of Life from BJU Biology, 4th edition. So the first section we're going to cover, Section 1A, is about God and science. So our objectives today will be to define the creation mandate and give examples of its application, define truth, explain the relationship between God and science, and describe the necessity of modeling and its relationship to the nature of science. So the first thing I want to talk about is the creation mandate, because this really kind of governs uh, everything that we do in science as Christians. And this comes from Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And this is the task of exercising wise dominion and stewardship over God's creation, which was assigned originally to Adam and Eve. We can't just do whatever we want with the earth because it does belong to God, but we need to use it responsibly. Okay, and that is what the creation mandate does says. And so that's part of what we study in this class. How can we use creation responsibly? And the first thing I want to take a look at is what is truth? What is truth? Is truth what everybody believes? And what I want to take a look at here is something called the doctrine of humors. This was the belief that living things are composed of four different humors or fluids, and that the ratio between these humors affected the function of the organism. Now, this was proposed by Hippocrates, considered to be the father of modern medicine. Um, he was Greek. And this was believed from ancient times until the mid-1800s. So this was believed for a very long time. And it is also why people were bled. That's why there's a picture of a leech in the background, because that was taking one of those fluids out that was out of balance, that was making people sick. So they would actually bleed people. So if you've heard of stories of people going to the barber and being bled, that is what was going on there. In fact, that is believed to be part of what killed our first president, George Washington. He became very ill. And so he, the prescription for his illness was to be bled. And so um, we know nowadays that that's not a good idea to lose blood while you're sick is, is not a good thing. And so, um, but it was widely believed. So truth is not necessarily what everybody believes. So if truth isn't what everybody believes, is truth a hunch that works? There was something called the doctrine of signatures. This is the belief that the creator left signs or signatures in plants and other organisms that showed which ailments or organs they were intended to treat. And the background is a plant called lungwort. And it was called lungwort because it was believed that the leaves, this mottled color, looked like diseased lungs with spots on them. This was uh, behind a lot of medieval medicine. And some examples are liverwort, which is in the background. It was believed because it looked kind of like a liver to uh, cure liver ailments. There was also dog tooth lichen. And dog tooth lichen was believed to uh, cure diseases that were caused when you were bitten by a dog. Uh, lungwort, because it looked like diseased lungs, was thought to cure lung diseases. And hairy cap moss um, was believed to give you some hair. Uh, and so that was behind a lot of medieval medicine. And today we know that that is not necessarily true. Do a lot of our medicines, are they derived from plants? Absolutely. But we can't just tell by looking some, at something what it will cure. So if truth isn't uh, hunches, how about repeated observations? So spontaneous generation is a supposed process by which non-living things can be changed directly into living things. This was something commonly believed because uh, 
people couldn't necessarily tell where different organisms came from. For example, uh, flies, common flies that we have today, they thought came from decaying meat because they didn't have microscopes to see eggs that were laid on that meat. Uh, things like uh, frogs and fish were believed to rain out of the sky um, because the rain brought those things because people couldn't, didn't associate the eggs to the uh, fish and the frogs. So just things like that. Another thing was they would make infusions. This is a solution made by boiling grain and water and then used for growing microorganisms. So they knew that if they made an infusion, that microbes would grow in the infusion. And a microscope probe is a microscopic organism found in infusions. So they thought that the infusion, something in the infusion is what created the microorganism. So something non-living could make something that was living. Um, and they would observe this. They performed lots of experiments to show this. And so just because we think we know what we're observing, doesn't necessarily mean that it is true. Microorganisms, bacteria comes from other bacteria, not from the fact that we have an infusion, even though they grow very well in an infusion. So they're growing in it, but they did not come from it. How about this one? Is truth that which is logical? Logical reasoning is the process of arriving at a conclusion through a series of ordered steps. In fact, logical reasoning is the one of the reasons that you study science and math is to teach you how to think logically. So is that truth? Um, one type of logical reasoning is inductive reasoning. This is the process of beginning with many facts or assumptions in order to reach a general conclusion. We do this a lot in science. We collect facts and try to reach a conclusion. Some example, or an example is principles of gravity can be induced by dropping many objects. So we drop a lot of things. We observe all the time that they drop. We come up with the law of gravity to say that when you drop, when you drop things, they're going to fall to the ground. That's pretty logical. There's also deductive reasoning. This begins with premises. Uh, assumed to be true and develops a specific conclusion. So an example is all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. So the conclusion is Socrates is mortal. This can lead to faulty conclusions though. For example, we might say all feathered creatures can fly. Ostriches have feathers. So the conclusion would be that ostriches can fly. And we know that that is not true. So even logical reasoning does not always develop truth. So what about is truth that which is accepted by faith? All things accepted by faith are not necessarily true. For example, you see this bridge here. You look at that bridge and you walk across it and you have faith that it will hold you or you wouldn't walk across it. So but what if that wasn't true? What if it collapsed while you were walking across it? That would mean that your faith was not true, okay, if that bridge collapsed. You also, when you go to a doctor, you put your faith in that doctor that they can have answers to help heal you of a problem. Well, if you go to a doctor who uh, uses the doctrine of signatures, that might not be a very good idea. That is not a good place to put your faith in. Or what about this one? What if you don't believe there's a hell? Does that mean that there isn't one still? No, it's still a real thing whether you believe it or not. Whether you have faith that there is a hell or not, it is still true that there is a hell. So that's not necessarily what truth is either. However, truth is the word of God. Let's take a look at some passages. In John 14, 6, um, Jesus says, I am the truth. So let me read that for you. So John 14, 6. 
Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There are more examples in John 14, 17. We read, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Also, John 15, 26, which says, but when the helper comes whom I shall send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify of me. From John 16, 13, we read, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. In John seventeen seventeen, we read, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, in the Old Testament, there's also Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament, firmament excuse me, shows his handiwork. This shows that we don't have just a blind faith. We have a faith that we can see. We can see it all around us as evidence in the world around us, in the creation. And we also serve a God of logic. In 1 Corinthians 14, 33, we read, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. We know that we serve an orderly God because we do observe laws of nature around us that are very orderly. So if science doesn't help us to discover truth, why do we study science um, if it's not necessarily about truth? The reason is we study science to help us to develop models. A model is an explanation or representation of how something works. So we study science to help us understand how God's wor world works. We make models that are workable that help us to explain what's going on, and also to help us hopefully predict what is going to happen. For example, the law of gravity predicts that when objects are dropped, that they will fall. Uh, so that is the purpose of science, to develop models to help us explain creation. And a definition of science is a body of facts that man has repeatedly observed about the physical universe around him. So science is about exploring God's universe um, and explaining it. And as we explore and explain to better appreciate it and really learn more about God. Now, if you are listening to this video as a test to make sure that you're listening, I want you to, next to your name, either write or draw what your favorite thing in science is to study. So our objectives were to define the creation mandate and give examples of its application, define truth, explain the relationship between God and science, and describe the necessity of modeling and its relationship to the nature of science. Now, the last thing I want you to do is you need to write five questions in the margin of your notes. This is five questions for the entire section, not five sections per page, but five questions for the entire section. What you have to do is next to your notes where you find the answer, you write a question that is answered by your notes. So for example, maybe next to model, you write, what is a model? And then in your notes, you would be able to find that answer. So uh that is it for this video i will have many more and um i will see you in the next video